Now's our opportunity to hear from two really remarkable women who are our honorees as well tonight. Maya Korangal um, and, and, and Carol Larson is, are about to come up on stage. Let me just say a word about both. Maya um, spent most of her early life in Asia. She's the daughter of a, of a German father and a Filipino mother. Do I have that right? Um, and she, I'm, I'm going to ask her about that early childhood and what guided her and her choices. Uh, but she has been in the world of investment for throughout her career. Um, she's a graduate of Harvard, Harvard Business School. She's kind of a smarty pants, um, and so, and she's in the process of really changing the face of impact investing and of invest investing itself. So, Maya, why don't you come on up? I have have something here for you. And now, it's, it's difficult for me to introduce Carol Larson. She's um, one of the most wonderful people in, in my life since I've been in, in California. Uh, she's the president and CEO of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, which we all know well. Um, she has a humility about her, which is um, extraordinary, um, and is the reason she's been so effective. She started out as a, as a lawyer. She went to Stanford for undergraduate. She then went to Yale for law school. And you all know that the reason you go for, to Yale for law school is because you want to affect positive social change as opposed to be in the courtroom all the time. And, um, and that is what Carol has done. So please join me in congratulating Carol Larson. I almost gave her Maya's award, so <laughs> we're not that generous. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I am, I'm going to start by asking you the question I asked HR, um, and Carol, I'll start with you, um, with the point at which you realized that what you wanted to do was serve and make a difference in the way in which you have. When I first became cognizant, I think. <laughs> so uh, my dad was a Lutheran minister, and my mom was a nurse, and I was born in Lake Wobegon in Minnesota. <laughs> but seriously, it was a town of 3,000. But um, definitely they had both chosen careers where it was part of their orientation in life that they were needed to live their life in a way that would be about doing something more for social good. And... Um, and we'll get into it, I'm sure, but then probably by the time I was in ninth grade, eighth or ninth grade, I already knew I was very interested in not just that I loved kids, but I loved thinking about government policy toward kids and how can our country do a better job around that, which then propelled me to college and then right into law school. So I had the advantage of knowing what I wanted to do. I'll say one more thing. It was the, it, I graduated from high school in 71 and from law school in 75, no, 75 and 78. But it was the 70s were such a great decade for social change. Um, Marion Wright Edelman was my hero, heroine and she had just started the Children's Defense Fund and Mental Health Law Project had started and the Disabilities Law Project had started. It was a time of real activism of young people and establishing public policy places for change. So that's where I was headed. And you were part of a piece of legislation where you're not pressing forward on legislation for disabled children, right, is that yeah. right? So when I got out of law school, I clerked for a year, which is a great thing to do. And, um, and then I worked for a nonprofit in Los Angeles because Right to Education for the Handicapped Act had just been passed. So all of a sudden, parents across the country who had been tremendous advocates for social change, had new rights vis-a-vis -vis the school system to have individualized education plans for their kids. So I went to work training them in Los Angeles and really statewide about advocacy with, with, um, you know, with the school system. So I, I first should just mention that um, Carol's daughter, Britta, is here. Yeah. Uh, there's Britta, <laughs> right before my very eyes. Um, and Nora, her niece, is also here. 
So thank you. And and but your eldest daughter is off. You we, you have to explain to us why she's not here. Yes. Well, does any is anyone wearing all birds? <laughs> oh come on. Yeah. All right. Good. So um, I went and thanked the Bain table because when when Britta's sister Hannah, who's now 27, graduated from college, uh, she was an Earth Systems major at Stanford. But then she had the wisdom, I think, to go work with Bain Consulting. And boy, they did a great job of professional development, feedback, teaching basic skills. And then she said, I really want to go and try a startup. And so she was a pretty early employee of Allbirds. Um, and it's a great shoe company. Check it out. But she's their sustainability person, which is a big piece of their of their um, brand, right? And so they're, she's flying all around the world on the really growing interest in sustainable apparel and getting carbon out of, out of the supply chains. So that's where she is tonight, but she sends her best. <laughs> so, so that apple didn't, didn't uh, fall too far from the tree, and it sounds like in, your parents passed on right. their values yeah. to you as well. Now, Maya, I'm going to ask the same question of you. Um, at what point, and what point did you become really aware of, conscious of poverty and the notion that one could do something about it? I, I, I um, think about General McMaster. You said you were about three. I wasn't quite that young, but I was maybe five, six years old. And I grew up, my German father was a hotelier, and I actually grew up in a hotel. I grew up in uh, a hotel in Singapore. Um, it was a beautiful, um, clean, immaculately run hotel, which is what Germans do well. Um, and uh, um, I lived, uh, you know, on the top floor um, in an air-conditioned room. And every summer, my family would go back to the Philippines, where my mother was from. And there was, you know, a huge long ride from the airport back to my grandparents' house, which was a very lovely house in a neighborhood. But on the way, when the car would stop... Um, at stoplights, um, little children who were about my age would run up and knock on the car window and beg. And they had no shoes, and they had tattered clothes, but they kind of looked like me. And um, as a small child, I would go to sleep at night. This is actually really true. Um, I would go to sleep at, at night, and I would think about the fact that I was lucky enough to be um, sleeping in a safe house with a nice roof in, you know, with my grandparents around me, and that there were these kids on the other side of the wall who basically lived in shacks, and how lucky I was that I was just born in the circumstances that I was. And um, when I got older, and my family had moved to the United States at that time, when I graduated from uh, college, um, I told my father um, and mother that I wanted to go join the Peace Corps. And, uh, you know, my father looked a little bit concerned, um, my mother a little concerned, you know, sending their kid off to, you know, somewhere in the world. Um, and my father sort of said to me, um, as a good German does, that, well, I admire that, my dear. I think that's a wonderful plan, but you should have an apprenticeship. You should go and you should learn from people who can teach you and you should do something with that. And then 10 years later, maybe 15 years later, 20 years later, don't lose hope of your dreams. Go back to doing what you want to do to do something good for the world, but maybe you can do more if you learn some skills along the way before you go join the Peace Corps. So those are my two stories. Well, and you, you learn to form your own integrated life. Um, so, so I guess going into economic development wasn't his hope for you. It was banking. Say something about your, your early jobs. So I, um, when I graduated from college, I um, ended up um, uh, effectively listening to my father and... Uh, I ended up working for an investment bank called uh, Wolfenson, um, which was a pretty amazing place, um, run by a gentleman named Jim Wolfenson, who l later went on become, to become uh, president of the World Bank. And we had global sort of clients around the world. And when I graduated from business school, um, I went to another uh, global uh, uh, investment uh, house called Warburg Pincus, which was a pretty incredible place and uh, ended up working in Asia. And it was there that, uh, with some senior partners at Warburg Pincus, I learned about a concept called microfinance, 
Um, and microfinance was this notion of providing um, small working capital loans to very low income people so that they could invest in a small business and um, work their way to a better life. Actually, Premal Shaw is here from Kiva, which is one of the great um, microfinance um, accelerators uh, in the world. That, that uh, So hats off to, to Premal over there. But, um, what I learned in, in my experience with microfinance was that if you could bring business and market forces and capital um, to uh, the informal sectors of society, and if you could bring some of the uh, scale and innovation and creative thinking that you know came from here in Silicon Valley, that maybe you could say, scale solutions that would have a dent in poverty and that could work side by side with philanthropy to make a change in the world. And so um, that was how my journey um, in microfinance started. And you know, I just wanted to say that the, the main reason I'm here today is on behalf of my colleagues at the RISE Fund and TPG who are sitting at several tables here. And this award is really for all of our collective work because what we're trying to do is show that business and um, and capitalism, which has a very um, uh, jaded uh, image around it today, but that we can take some of the tenets of the business world and use it to solve social problems, environmental problems, bring it to scale solutions in education, healthcare, clean energy, um, financial services, and do some good in the world. I think what's what's fascinating. I think what's fascinating about both of your careers, and I'm not sure I'd call them careers as, as much as callings. Um, you've been able to, to figure out how to way to, to follow your calling um, and and make that a, a career. But the other thing that's fascinating about it is that you get to learn constantly. And I think that's a philanthropy is all about the constant learning. Um, I think many philanthropists, I know you, Carol, think that part of your job is to contribute to field-wide learning as well. I, I wanted to ask you how you at the Packard Foundation go about learning, who you consult, who you turn to. And I raised that because I know there was a point at which in a, uh, in a program you'd had for a very long time, you'd achieved your goals, and then you wanted to know, well, what next? And so what did you do to answer that question? Yeah. So... Um, I want to go back to this uh, career piece that Maya just brought up too, because I think it's real, and I'll get to it because I think it's really appropriate for this event about celebrating how all three sectors can really make a difference. And um, the same thing kind of happened to me, although I didn't have parents who told me it, but I decided to go into practicing law in LA for seven years, doing civil commercial litigation. When I called up the Children's Defense Fund, and they offered me a job, and I said, I think I'll go practice law in LA. They said, yeah, well, why don't you try coal mining, too? You know, you might like that. <laughs> but it was really a great experience, and I picked up a lot of great skills. And I'll, I'll return to this at the end of the evening, but, you know, seven years in, being a partner, owning a house, it wasn't why I went to law school. It wasn't that, that long-term passion. So that's when I rolled the dice and got a little program officer job with Packard, and Dave Packard was still alive. So now I'll segue, which then I never would have predicted it would have turned out as well as it did, but it was, I really do think there are many ways to contribute, and that's what I really saw in those law firms, is that there were partners in those firms or partners out here, you know, who really are affecting huge social change without necessarily doing it full time in their job. So I will go back to that, but I just wanted to pick up on what Maya said. But then moving from that is I did start to work at Packard in 1989 as an employee, and Dave Packard was still alive. So we're the private family foundation of Dave Packard, co-founder of Hewlett Packard. Unlike the Hewlett Foundation, which also has a very strong private family fo private foundation, we are a family foundation. So we have eight family members and eight general trustees on our board. But the reason I get back to listening and who do we learn from is that I was fortunate enough to join a foundation whose donor had, was known for a set of values, the HP Way. And the HP Way was about discovery and learning and changing and listening and valuing your employees. And that set of values carries over into our foundation. So starting right from the top, it helped 
that I think I've contributed to those values over the year and reinforcing the culture, but I didn't create it. And that's why even now as they go into finding a new CEO, since I'm stepping down, and that I'm sure that they'll continue. But I do think that it's such an important inflection point for philanthropy and probably for mission investors and all of us, is that more than ever we need to listen. Um, when General McMaster was talking about strategic narcissism, I thought, is he talking about philanthropy? No. <laughs> Over my 15 years as president at Packard, it's been huge, the leadership of philanthropists, to be more strategic, to really have goals and work toward them and realizing how philanthropy can be a passing gear and needs to be, needs to be about social change. But I think we also have sometimes been a little narcissistic about to the extent we had that answer. So we all need to get much better at listening and listening not just to our peers or people in this room, but listening to people on the ground, the people that Maya saw firsthand growing up. And at Packard, we really try to do that. So the best way we know when to change is if we have a good ear to the ground. And if we approach our work with people on the ground, in touch, not just us in Los Altos, deciding on our strategy. And um, so we, we need to keep improving on that, but that's, it, it goes back to Dave and Lucille, right? And that, that orientation. So I was actually thinking of, I realized now that your, the, the early childhood development program. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was, that, that hit this moment of inflection. And you went out and talked to families, didn't the, the foundation right. do that? Yeah. Well, we've focused on early childhood a lot, uh, domestically. Um, and, you know, when you look, and this is a, this is, a passion that I'm going to return to in my post-Packard years, is how does this country support families of young children, and especially birth to three? So we had been focused on preschool for many years, Packard has, and with a lot of partners in the country, and particularly in California, we pretty much have great expansion of eligibility for preschool and subsidized preschool. But if you look at birth to three, our country has changed in terms of how many are women in, are in the workforce, and yet we haven't evolved enough at all into how we support those families. I mean, even when Britta was a child, it was $1,000 a month, and I had two of them under five. You know, and that was a long time ago, Britta, 24 years, yeah. So um, we don't provide support. So family, friends, and neighbors, that's where most of the children are in birth to three. And we need to do a better job as a country. So we thought, well, we better do ethnographic studies. I mean, have anthropologist types and sociologists go do focus groups, really talk to especially moms uh, who are raising young children about where they could get support and where their neighbors who are taking care of their kids can get support. So maybe that's what you were referring to is yeah. how do we shape that strategy? It's very real. Yeah. Yeah. And you ended up making some real changes right. as a result of what, of what you learned. There's another trend. I mean, one of the, I think, big things that's happened with philanthropy is, is this notion that it's part of your job to contribute to field-wide learning so that others can, can learn from both your successes and add failures and accelerate, accelerate change. But there's another trend, uh, and I'll get to one that will take us right back to, to Maya, but there's another one, and it's toward collaboration. It used to be that foundations pretty much did their own thing, and they had their own endowment, they could do their own thing, they could follow their own course, and now they begin to say to themselves, well, gee, I could have a lot more impact if I were working with others. What, how has that affected your own thinking? Because you were one of the originals. I mean, the Climate Works Foundation was one yeah. of the first examples yeah. of this, so go ahead. So um, the good news is there's so much we can do together, and I was encouraged by the DNA of the Packard family to uh, lead from the middle, or it doesn't matter where I lead from. Could be in the front, could be in the middle, could be behind. But it's... And besides, you're a middle child. Yes, so I'm a middle to child, too. But that it really matters to be in partnership with others. So back in 2008, uh, Pack, or Hewlett and Packard were really sister foundations in many ways, said climate change is the biggest issue of our time. And with the support of our boards, we each made a half a billion dollar commitment to start a collaboration that would work globally on climate issues. And McKnight Foundation joined us. Today there are 
like 15 different foundations. But I urge you to check out the site of Climate Works. Um, there is room for more collaboration by both business and nonprofits and individuals. And we still believe, no matter how much I care about early childhood and everything else, that it is the issue of our time. And it's our issue whether it, you care about peace and justice or you care about women or you care about health. So I really hope people here are engaged in thinking about how they can contribute, whether it's at the state, local, national, global level. We're in San Francisco, and wasn't it fabulous last fall when Global Climate Action Summit happened? And this city was a buzz from all with people all around the world, from for-profit sector, from government, saying we're going to keep making progress in this area. And at that meeting, I think it was 29 philanthropies committed four billion dollars over the next five years. But as Larry Kramer at Hewlett would tell you, and we all really believe, it's, it's going to take a lot more. And business is going to be a big part of it. You know, we're reaching those inflection points where the cost has come down enough on solar or renewable energy that you can really start to see business aligning with what we need to do for the environment, so. Well, of course. <laughs> of course, that, that is an issue area where it is immediately apparent that all three sectors have a role to play. There's policy, there's business practice, uh, and of course, philanthropy. The other big issue of our time, Maya, is inequality, here but also globally. Talk a little bit about the specific investments you're making at the RISE Fund, because they go in the field of education, they go in the field of financial services, their health, is the whole range of issues that affect the poverty equation. Share with us some of, some of those investments so that we can picture what it is you do. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that um, uh, if you look at the uh, portfolio that we've built um, with the RISE Fund, which is today um, close to about 30 uh, companies around the world, so in the U.S., but also Latin America, Africa, India, um, China, across healthcare, education, financial services, again, energy, food and agriculture, a lot of um, technology um, uh, embedded there. Um, a lot of what we're doing is democratizing access to uh, services. Um, a lot of what we're doing is about providing access to high quality education and healthcare. And one of the things that we do with our investments is to look um, very closely at what academic research um, tells us that, that the good of these investments do. And if you just look at our um, education portfolio, which um, has built a set of assets across personalized learning um, and vocational training, um, you know, if you look at one of our, our, our companies here um, in the U.S. called Dreambox, and many in this room um, may have school-aged children who have used Dreambox to learn math, what we find is that um, kids, especially um, those, those children in public school systems that um, have a high proportion of free or, you know, reduced lunch, who use these kinds of programs, have educational outcomes that are effectively far superior to um, what you would have if you don't have access to these kinds of technologies. So what Dream Doc, Dreambox does, for example, very simply, is it um, serves up a set of math questions to children and using very complex algorithms starts to uh, bring questions to children based on how it understands that child's brain works to solve a problem. And if you can imagine, you know, you have one teacher in a classroom of anywhere from 20 to 30 kids, and the one teacher can teach one method, but each child learns how to solve a problem pretty differently. And a tool like Dreambox can help the child get there. What's important, and, and, and if you think about um, inequality and, and poverty, is that education is one of the greatest boosts to, um, to uh, uh, income attainment over lifetime. And that's been looked at and been studied and, by vetted, and been vetted by um, uh, lots of uh, scientific research. So if we can effectively um, uh, deliver these kinds of educational um, tools and aids to children in a way and through a business that 
is um, successful by its own merits as a business, but the core and sole purpose of that business is to help a child learn so that that child graduates and that child gets a better job and gets um, an income boost over their lifetime, this is one of the ways that we make a dent in poverty. And if you look across our healthcare portfolio, it's the same thing. Most um, individuals in the US or around the world um, fall back into poverty because they have a health incident in the family that they can't um, take care of. You know, a primary bedwinner, a breadwinner um, gets sick. Um, the ho whole household loses its income. If you look in the emerging markets, they don't have any form of insurance, so that that um, that medical condition can't be taken care of. If we invest in healthcare um, across the board, we can improve their. Uh, economic circumstances. So these are the kinds of investments that we make to try and and uh, and reduce inequality in the world. Yeah. So Carol, the, the the precursor to, uh, in fact, investing was program related investing and mission investing, and you'll probably have to define those those terms for us. But this is an area in which Packard played a, a very big role, starting in 1980. Yeah. Say something about that yeah. experience. It's great. Well, overall, what an exciting time to have the RISE Fund, to have so many people being involved on pushing this alignment between doing well and doing good, between social change. But there is another tool for philanthropies uh, called program-related investments, where the market isn't seeing the opportunity. There's no one wanting to invest in it. And philanthropy under IRS regs can make up an investment called a program-related investment that our goal is basically to have the principal returned it's usually a debt in our case, a debt vehicle, and then make one or 2% interest. So some of the great, we've done $760 million worth of this in, since the 1980s, and um, some of the things that we've helped do is start agroforestry businesses, you know, to kind of prove their worth or de-risk it for equity investors. I'm particularly proud of what we've done in reproductive health and rights. Um, I'm sure we'll get to that before time's up, but the, uh, that we, we helped invest in a company that brought emergency contraception plan B to market because for-profit investors weren't doing it. We made the loan, they brought it through the FDA approval, a pharmaceutical company bought it out, and we've done this on a number of, of different things. So it's been a great vehicle, and right now philanthropies across the country are looking at that whole spectrum, you know, from program-related principal return all the way to full equity investment. And I just want to do one shout out because one of my favorite people, Bill Draper, is in the audience. And Draper, Richard Kaplan, and what they're doing with social entrepreneurs and really nurturing them as they start these great new, new companies. Uh, it's just an exciting time to be young. It's probably an exciting time to be 66 too, but anyway. <laughs> There's so many levers for social change. And what's interesting to me is that each institution, each sector is now becoming increasingly aware of, of the other and the opportunity. But we think of philanthropy, Maya, as a place where you, 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 can, you can create new models uh, that you hope others will then take to scale. And, and impact investing really started with the Rockefeller Foundation, or at least that, that concept. Talk a little bit about the concept and, and rise itself because it's it's different from other impact. And, well, it is a it is a real live normal investment firm that is investing for impact. Yeah, and if I can start, Jane, with just underscoring that notion that um, philanthropy and the government took a tremendous uh, they take tremendous risk, um, and um, often the investments made by the government and the risk taken by philanthropies to um, fund different initiatives has paved the way for corporations and then financial investors like ourselves um, to, to come in and, and take those concepts forward. So the, the RISE Fund is, is fairly unique. Um, as, as Jane mentioned, the term impact investing was coined in about 2007 um, at a Rockefeller Foundation uh, event at, at, at Bellagio. And the concept of impact investing is 
to um, invest uh, with an objective of uh, both the production of social or environmental good, but also a financial return. But for the last 10 years or so, it hasn't been clear whether that financial return was going to be a market rate of return or a below market rate of return, and, and largely um, in the market that, that was very unproven. And what the RISE Fund um, really set out to do was to institu institutionalize this notion that there are investments that can be made where there isn't tension or friction between financial return and business success and uh, the creation of great impact. And so what we um, wanted to do was to bring one of the great investing teams um, in global private equity, which is the, the team at TPG Growth, and to create um, a fund, um, the fund that we raised was a, is, a, is a $2 billion fund, which is the largest um, impact uh, fund in the market by a factor of um, four or five times the, the, the next largest one. And um, to show that in certain uh, situations, when very carefully curated, we can find businesses that um, produce social or environmental good as a core part of their DNA, and the um, success that they uh, have in creating positive impact um, is also that which reinforces their success uh, financially, and, and that's really evident in, in our portfolio. And what we were able to do by um, putting forward this, this um, investment thesis was to bring pension funds and institutional investors who had so far been curious about the market but hadn't come into the market. Um, and as fiduciaries of the, uh, the, 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 the money of, of pensioners and um, universities, et cetera, they could not sacrifice uh, commercial return. But here um, we made a commitment that we were going to deliver the same kind of financial re return that we do for the other funds managed by TPG, but we were also going to bring evidence-based, um, very deep um, and thoughtful, well-measured, well-reported on impact. And, you know, there are a number of our other um, uh, collaborators here in the room, you know, Bain and KPMG and uh, Cleary. There are a number of firms who came to the table um, to help us do this work, and it's a collaborative effort, and some of our investors are the original philanthropies and the original foundations, and they really paved the way for us to be able to do this work. Yeah. And of course, you had the support of TPG's two co-founders, Dave Bonderman and Jim Coulter. Jim is here tonight, so uh, we have a lot to be grateful to you for. Um, it, it, what is fascinating about this, about the Rise Fund, about you, Maya, um, is, is that I think you're changing the face of investing, and now everyone has got an opportunity to affect social change um, in, in, in all aspects of their lives. Carl, Carol, the, you've developed tremendous expertise, personally, your program officers and the foundation, in, in several issue areas. One of them is reproductive health, um, which is an issue that's very much in the news today. Uh, lots of concern about legislation that's passed in Alabama and elsewhere and the possible testing of Roe v. Wade. There's another area where you have deep expertise and that is marine conservation. Um, when does it make sense for the foundation, known for being humble, when does it make sense for the foundation or for you to use your voice based on that knowledge? Yeah. We've always had, it's part of the family values and the, the DNA, one of our core values is belief in leadership and we're usually talking about the leadership of our grantees and the people doing the work. But in our oceans work, we realize especially that our voice is really important. We've done a lot of partnerships with The Economist and others. It's a tremendous, one of our program people from that work is here, a tremendous progress over 20 years in terms of promoting sustainable fishing practices. The family also built the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and they also fund a deep ocean research institute. So it's just many facets of entry for pushing the health of our oceans. And so, uh, but it's a, it's a sign of great progress where actually alignment, especially in the fishing industry, is really coming together to have that tipping point of, of um, business alignment with, with conservation. So. Um, we, in, we really invite people to join us on that one. Uh, it's, it's exciting work. 
That is now promoting market-facing practices, um, you know, uh, working with retailers, 25 of the top retailers of seafood in this country right now. 95% of those top 25 asked ask for certified seafood. You know, it was Whole Foods and it was um, Safeway and others. Uh, so real progress where it's come together. But in the early years, it wasn't that. It was... It was raising awareness, it was supporting advocacy, it was supporting policy papers. And so I go now to reproductive rights because in, in our voice in seafood, it really is alignment with business, media, et cetera. Reproductive health and rights, we have to engage every person in this country, and especially the women. And it really has to do with the inequality. And I think that the policy that's winning right now, or is most visible, is way out of touch with what women want and need and what their partners want and need. And so we're using our voice in a different way. I've started a donor collaborative, basically to reach out to people with, with significant resources to say, you can get off the sidelines now. You join a small group of us who have been funding in this area for a long time, and come learn with us and experiment. So we've launched this collaborative. It's already an additional $50 million a year going into reproductive health and rights here in the United States. And we need more, lots more. But the other thing is, um, you know, the role of, of women, I'm gonna get a shout out to a couple brand new organizations, the Supermajority Education Fund, um, and they also have a C4, but that's where Ai-jen Poo of Domestic Workers Alliance and Cecile Richards and a bunch of other leaders are saying, this isn't an issue that's just owned about reproductive rights. There's a cluster of issues to support women and their, economic, their ability to work in the economy that we need to stand up for. And you see it with all the town hall meetings and others that are happening across the country. So I'd say we're using our voice in a different way there. It's all about impact. It's all about, not about when can we get our name out there, but when can it actually help to have our leadership. That's the cause. Um, so each of you um, has a deeply satisfying uh, career. Uh, you're, you're following your own values. You're making a mammoth difference. Um, you do have folks measuring that difference, of, of both in, in impact investing and in, in philanthropy. So it's it's kind of... It's inescapable that you are. Um, Carol, I'm going to start with you and ask you if you have advice for the students here, um, and if there's something that you haven't yet done in your career that you'd like still to do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a great question. So um, for the young people here, it really, like when I said that the 70s and 80s were really exciting times for starting new ways of, of being active in this country, as we've talked about tonight, it's a really exciting time of opportunity. And Dave Packard, one of our favorite sayings at Packard is he would give the advice, it was about oceans, I think, but it was go deep and stay long. So I'm going to apply that to you as an individual. You know, go deep in your heart and what really thrills you. For me, it ended up being early childhood. And stay long but there's not one way. You could go to Bain for a few years. You could go to Rise Fund. You could go teach and teach for America. You could go into a philanthropy. The path forward is, is many, many options. And if you go deep and stay centered in what you care about, you're going to live a really full life if you devote yourself to trying to make the world a better place. So I don't think Dave ever used the expression in that way, but just hearing and seeing the young people tonight, it, it rings true for me. So, HR, am I right that two of your daughters have been to Teach for America? Yeah. So, it doesn't matter which sector you choose, you can serve. Maya, same question to you. I, I think it would, what I would add, and I, I wholly agree with, with um, um, what my, my fellow honorees have said, is um, life is an apprenticeship. And one of the best things that you can do, if you're lucky enough, is to work um, from... Uh, work with individuals who are great at their craft. Um, and, you know, life never stops being an apprenticeship. For me, um, it's been working with some of the 
greatest in, in, investors of all time, you know, Mr. Coulter over there um, being one today, my colleagues at the, the, the tables here are learning from them every day. But when you work with people who are great at their craft and love what they do, it'll make you better. And I think, um, Jane, in, in you, we have some a shining example of someone who is really, really, really gifted at, at her craft, partly because you love it so much. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky to find that, um, you know, life is long, but you, you can never stop learning, and, and it's an apprenticeship all the way. So please join me in celebrating all three of our honorees, HR, Maya, Carol.